Today on Consumer Watch, we look at a shocking new danger in the high street. Hairspray, head bobbing syndrome. <laughs> All Jill wanted was beautiful hair. Had she known it would cost her control of her neck and head, <laughs> she would have thought twice. I had greasy, lifeless hair. I wanted more body, more shine. I don't know, more something. And I got it. My life is ruined. I just can't keep my head still anymore. My friends have had the same terrible experience. We all have lovely hair, but our lives are ruined. We can't eat properly. Hats keep falling off. And my sex life is ruined. Sadly, Jill and her friends are not alone. Thousands of women all over the country have been tragically afflicted. <laughs> Wendy, love, how long have you been a hairspray head bobber? Five years now. That's right. And you have, in fact, set up your own victim support group? All the women that you see here today have been affected by conventional hair products. Mm. And not only are heads are affected. That's right. We're now going to meet some unfortunate people who are far more seriously afflicted. They have, in fact, contracted hairspray whole body bobbing syndrome. <laughs> people who have the misfortune to use studio line. <laughs> It's pitiable. We'll be back after this. to the man from auntie now i don't want to start on a downer but too much is going wrong for me to ignore it i believe that there is a ministry of crap design its tentacles are everywhere a recent article in a newspaper informed us that environmentally concerned scientists are at present attempting to locate a metal which will conduct heat with super efficiency and hence save energy very nice but such a metal already exists it's the metal out of which they make the teapots that you get in motorway service stations. <laughs> They're brilliant, aren't they? I'd like a pot of tea for two, please, and some savlon and a bandage. <laughs> and when I burn the skin off my hand on the handle. Ladies and gentlemen, that has got to be deliberate. You couldn't make a mistake that stupid. <laughs> a teapot that you can't pick up. <laughs> the tea's gone cold. <laughs> now, you're not going to tell me that's a mistake. It needs a special kind of genius. And, of course, it's not just the teapots. The cups have also been designed by the Ministry because you can't pick them up either. The handle having an orifice which could only be used by a small child or a waif-like supermodel. <laughs> you can't get your finger through the hole in the handle. You have to grip it between your thumb and your forefinger. It's like picking up a chair from the bottom of the leg. Oh, I nearly got it up. Oh, it's a sort of pinch a grip, you've got it, you're struggling to raise it. It's teetering off its centre of gravity, falling forward. <laughs> but you've lifted the cup, you've got to lift the teapot, but you can't because it's too hot, but you want a cup of tea, so you have to use your initiative, which means using <laughs> the end of your jacket. So, you pick up the teapot. Oh, ha, 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 ha. You've got the mug, you've got the pot, you've got the pot, you've got the mug. Why? Why are you bothering at all? The Ministry of Crap Design is a mile ahead of you. These are pots are designed with cup avoiding a spouts. <laughs> you cannot get the tea into the cup. You tilt the pot, suddenly it's all over the table. How did you do that? I don't know how I did it. I just tilted the pot and now it's dripping off the table. Well, it's all in me handbag, you silly fool. I don't know. It's like, it's like there's a force field over the top of the cup. The tea is bouncing off. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's got to be deliberate. Anyone could design a working spout. They can get a bomb through a window in Baghdad. You're not going to tell me they can't get the tea from the pot into the cup. But no, it's all over the table. And it's amazing how much there is. It's like, there's tea everywhere. You're thinking, there was never that much in the pot. <laughs> Where's all the tea come from the pot? There's nothing. There's too much tea. The, these teapots 
are designed like TARDISes. <laughs> They're bigger on the inside. I mean, come on, when you get your pot, tea for two, you're thinking, oh, it's not enough there. <laughs> Is that for two? Is this for two? We asked for two. We, we paid for two. Is this for two? Is it what to do for two? We paid. Oh, mm, apparently it's for two. Yeah. <laughs> Tilly water, you haven't given us a jug of water. Can we have a jug of... Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> no, you can't, you see? And yet you look inside, you think there's never enough. There's never enough for two cups. You think you're going to have to wring the second cup out of the tea bag, aren't you? There you are. That's yours. You like it strong, don't you? <laughs> but once you've spilt it all over the table, there's gallons of the stuff. The table is a wash. You've got to clean it up. The nightmare of cleaning up the tea. She says, get some napkins in your seat, bugger. How do you look? I don't know how did it. It's just happened and it's there. Well, look, it's dripping everywhere. Get some napkins. Get nuts. <laughs> Running across the cafe to that, uh, the napkin plucker. You know that, that little, that little kind of metal coffin-shaped box they have on the counter? A little, with the napkins in, all filled with napkins, filled it up into a sort of oblong shape. You pluck them out. Plucking them out. Pluck, 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 pluck. You're plucking in all these napkins, little napkins, loads of them. Why? Why are you bothering to pluck even one napkin? The Ministry of Crap Design is a mile ahead of you. These napkins don't work. <laughs> the absorbent qualities of an armoured car. It's true, ladies and gentlemen, they're hard and shiny. They reject moisture. Have you ever tried to blow your nose on one? You end up with snot all over your cheek. <laughs> it's true, they reject moisture. If you're trying to mop up a splash of tea, you're chasing it up the couch. <laughs> chasing it back down again. They increase the mess. The more napkins you use, the worse the mess gets. Look. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to get heavy on you. I don't want to bring any of you down. But I think we should be warned. Because I believe that a terrible accident could occur. I think if you got the right combination of a moisture-increasing napkin and a TARDIS teapot, <laughs> you could drown in a little shower. When you blink your eyelids, you use over 40 different muscles. When you hear, your ears can differentiate over 60,000 individual sounds. You're amazing, and Booper want to keep you that way. Of course, people who use the NHS aren't very good at blinking, are they? <laughs> no, they have to use a bit of wire or something to make their eyes move. <laughs> and they're here using an old tin can and a bit of string. You're crap, and that's how the NHS is likely to end up. But the Ministry of Crap Design is surely everywhere. There is no part of our existence into which its tentacles do not intrude. Little pots of UHT cream with a spring hidden inside, so when you open them, they explode all over your town. Swing doors that open the wrong way. Noel's house party. The Ministry is everywhere. <laughs> Those are... Oh, radical stuff. Having a go at Noly, that'll shake the foundations of society. He's lost his edge, I swear it. Those, <laughs> those loo paper dispensers, those are classic. You've seen those in public toilets, you know? A metal box with a loo roll inside. At first glance, it would seem like an improvement. Certainly better than the old days. You know, the old days, the bad old days, when you had those individual sheets of what appeared to be a crinkly hardboard. <laughs> it didn't so much absorb it as spread it around. <laughs> you start off with a relatively clean box, and slowly but surely, you're spreading it after smelling your mouth. Well, it's true. If you use enough sheets of this stuff, you end up with a fresh jobby on top of your head. <laughs> but these days, you get those brilliant new metal dispensers, you know, with a whole roll of toilet paper in them, a metal dispenser, a whole roll. Oh, there's always a whole roll, isn't there? <laughs> and there's a reason for that. It's because you can't get any of it out of the dispenser. You sit there doing the toilet paper tease. Oh, nearly got it. Gently, a little bit more. Gently, <laughs> A little bit further, nearly got it. You know there's paper in there. How do you know? How do you know? Because the Ministry have kindly put a window in the dispenser. <laughs> you can see the paper, but you can't get it out. You're going, oh, gently does it. Oh, a little bit, nearly got the edge. Is that the edge? I don't know. If it's one of them big, roundy Ferris wheel type ones, you're disappearing up right on the side of the dispenser. Losing all the flesh on your arm from the serrated edge. They're amazing, those serrated edges. I mean, they can cut the skin on your arm, but they won't cut the bloody bog paper. <laughs> Eventually, you find the edge of the paper. Oh, you've teased it out, you've got the edge, but you don't know which way to pull it. Which way has it been loaded? You don't know where to pull it forward or back. There should be an arrow on it. You give it a gentle tug, can you risk it? Oh, no, you've torn it! <laughs> you try to wipe your bum with a thumbnail-sized bit of toilet paper. <laughs> we have to fight back. We've got to take responsibility for our lives.
All these things that are sent to try us, I claim could actually add to the sum of human happiness. Yes, yes. I'll take the toughest example of the lot, those bog roll dispensers. To take just one example, they don't work. They are there to irritate us and make our bums sore. But if we <laughs> thought laterally, I say we could turn them into marvellous aids to sexual sensitivity. <laughs> I sense doubt in the studio. <laughs> Well, let me run with it. Trust me. Give me a minute on this, OK? Because, let's face it, it's an important subject. Sexual sensitivity is something rarely discussed, particularly between a man and a woman. It's very difficult to broach the subject, particularly if you've been going out for a long time. It's funny, isn't it? The longer you leave it, the tougher it is to bring it up. It gets all sensitive. She says, look, love, you know when you... He says, all right, I'll just piss off then, if that's what you want. I'll just piss off out of your life if I'm not good enough. She says, look, it's only a little thing, but it's just when you wear the chicken suit, there's feathers scratch a bit. <laughs> Let's face it, men and women have different bodies. And men, particularly, need to learn to pace themselves. We do. Premature ejaculation is the curse of a young man. I mean, when you first get interested in sex, you only have to be with a woman and have an accident. It used to happen to me before I met the girl. <laughs> 1973, I'll be putting on my kipper tie, listening to Slade, I'll be thinking, oh, I might meet a girl tonight. Oh, no, it's gone off. <laughs> It's true. And some lads never learn to relax and take it easy. I mean, there will be some women watching tonight whose lover is... Well, he's not a bad bloke, is he, girls? <laughs> he's not a bad bloke. <laughs> he's just a bloody awful shame, that's all. <laughs> yes, there will be women watching, and there will be some blokes watching saying, if you laugh at this routine, <laughs> if you even say one word... <laughs> But it's true. I mean, you know, I mean, they're talking about cutting back on sex education as if people weren't ignorant enough. I mean, let's face it, there's blokes out there who think clitoris is a town in Greece. Now, be honest, he's trying. He's trying. He doesn't mean it. He says, look, love, if you really want us to concentrate on that area, well, we'll go there for our holidays. But I've only got two weeks in June. I am talking. I am talking about the sort of bloke whose idea of foreplay is to stick his tongue in your ear, say, are oh, you wet enough yet, love, cos I've got to work in the morning, you know? It's an important subject. I'm sure there are women watching who have a lover of the ilk of which I describe. Well, you've got to talk to him tonight. Not now, after the show. Not too early. <laughs> but tonight, say to him, you say, listen, baby, <laughs> darling, <laughs> you've got to say, slow down. <laughs> you've got to say, where's the fire? <laughs> Do the movements, girls. You've got to say, we can build a fire. <laughs> right here. <laughs> He'll say, what the flipping hell are you talking about? <laughs> but persevere, girls. Seize the moment, OK? Say, listen to me, my big boy. <laughs> no, flatter him up. It'll help. <laughs> you say, listen, my human girder. <laughs> Tonight, when we make love, which will be a surprise to him, cos he didn't realise you were going to, you know? <laughs> you say, what, is it June yet? What happened to Easter? <laughs> You say to him tonight, when we make love, your body is going to help my body, and my body is going to help your body, and we're going to fantasise together, we're going to share each other's most private fantasy. You'll probably have to phone this through to the pub, cos it'll bug it off by now. But <laughs> he'll be thinking about it, you know? I mean, he'll be down and going, oh, I don't know what's wrong with her tonight. <laughs> it's a plumbing, I'm sure of that. <laughs> when he gets home, girls, go for it, OK? Get him upstairs. Seize the moment. Say, right, tonight, my darling, this is our night before we make love. We're going to be ready. We're going to relax our bodies. We're going to share each other's fantasies. We're going to be things we never dreamt we could be. We're going to think things we never thought before. Because right now, for me, my big man, my darling lover, I want you to pretend that you are sat on a toilet and I am a bog paper dispenser. Oh, <laughs> a little bit of that. Just a little bit of that. Just a little bit of that. We're back. There's a lady here that wanted to say something, right? Yes, that's right, Oompa. I did want to say something. Good. Are you happy with that? I sure am. <laughs> okay, today, as you know, we are bringing people together with the parents they would have had had they been adopted. So, the woman sitting next to you is Joan. And you claim, had 
your birth parents died when you were a baby, Joan would have been the most likely person to have adopted you. That's right, Oompa. Mom was looking into adoption. Don't but... call me mom. I'm not your mom. Really, Joan does not believe you have the right to call her mom. I know that, Oompa, but I do. She adopted a small girl at that time, and had I been an orphan, that girl would have been me. I feel I have a right to find out more about the kind of life I would have led had I been adopted. Yes. At least, you know, I'm facing up to the fact that I have a problem. I mean, I think I should get credit for that. Your birth parents are here today. Oh. Ken, mm -hmm. Cindy, how do you feel about Sarah's quest? We're putting out love to her and we're keeping her. <laughs> Joan, are you a hard, unfeeling bitch? <laughs> rejecting a child you might have adopted? No! Uh, well, then Sarah is suing me for emotional cruelty and 26 years of birthday and Christmas presents. She's never been there for me. No. But I'm being strong here. I'm recognizing that I have a problem. Can't you do that? Yes! Oh. We'll be back after this. What is happening to this country? Sex, sleaze, violence, filth. But it's not all good news. <laughs> Come on, Prime Minister, get your act together. What mugs we are! <laughs> Ever since Monty Python, there's been this voice which we in comedy know as the sketch voice. It's the voice which people put on when they wish to suggest a comic character. Say, hello, I'm a very amusing sketch character. <laughs> but uh, the reason I'm amusing is because I'm very boring, stupid and insignificant. Now, I'm no actor. But you know something <laughs> vaguely familiar about that? <laughs> it's John Major. John Major is the sketch character we've all been doing for years. And we've made him Prime Minister. <laughs> How did it happen? With 60 million people in Britain, how did the single least impressive person in the country get to be Prime Minister? I mean, historians will be at a loss. Kids are like, sir, sir, how did John Major... Look, he just flipping did now. Get on with your work. <laughs> All right, Mrs. Thatch was a bit of a nasty old witch, but she had <laughs> something about her. You know, you could see how she got where she did. John Major? Who is he? <laughs> what is he? <laughs> the Sid Little of British politics. <laughs> and I'll tell you something very sinister. Sid's been off the telly for the same length of time. <laughs> But John's been Prime Minister, yes. Never seen in the same room together, are they? Same person. Look, take a close look at this photographic evidence. <laughs> Let them large at the height of their face. I mean, be honest, when John Major goes abroad... Come on, think about it. You see him on, on the news when he goes abroad. Don't you feel a bit embarrassed? <laughs> I mean, secretly, like when he meets Yeltsin or Chancellor Cole, you know, and he says, hello, I'm the British Prime Minister. <laughs> you can see him trying to work it out, and thinking, well, is this a trick? You know, I mean, is it my birthday? Is he a stripper prat? I mean, what's... <laughs> How does he keep his job? I mean, do the rest of the Cabinet think he makes them look good? <laughs> I'm saying, if I stand next to Major, perhaps I won't look quite such a smug, useless bastard. Is that... <laughs> we should write to That's Life. That's what we should do. We should write to Esther. Dear Esther, I voted for a government who promised to end the recession, create jobs, cut tax and build homes. A year later, I am still waiting. Signed, pissed off of the UK. <laughs> Esther would have a lovely time, wouldn't she? She'd love it. She'd say, well, pissed off. The first thing we discovered was that this isn't the first time this has happened. In 1979, 1983 and 87, much the same people were promising much the same things and simply failing to deliver. We contacted the people involved and they said, Actually, things are much better than people think. And did you know that the Labour Party is run by Marmite drillers and muff munchers and an enormous <laughs> man with moustaches who want to turn your children into lesbians and won't let them watch Romeo and Juliet? <laughs> the one thing this government has always claimed, above all, is to be the government of sensible economics. Excuse me. Uh, since 79, they've sold everything we ever had, they've used up all the oil in the North Sea, we pay more tax than we did under Labour, and we're still poorer than Italy. Sid Little really could have done as good a job, and at least... <laughs> at least he enjoys being laughed at. <laughs> it is one thing I can't stand! 
and its political correctness. What a load of rubbish. It's got so bad, you can't call someone a slant-eyed, black, wog, jew boy, bog Irish cooker without being called a homophobic racist. What's that under common sense? What man's we are! <laughs> And perhaps the most astonishing uh, aspect of the fact that things are so badly designed is that the designers, having messed up everything else, are now intent on redesigning us. It's true, these days, the images of beauty in magazines and movies no longer have any connection with the reality of being human. Models aren't models anymore, no. They are supermodels. These women are 17 feet tall. <laughs> Incredibly tall women, chips up on the ceiling, then there's nothing right down at the platform shoes on the floor. Nothing in between. Incredibly tall women. And anorexic. Everyone. You see them teetering along the catwalk, all thin and anorexic. I keep expecting the United Nations to fly in food. <laughs> Michael Burke to pop up and say, these women are literally starving. <laughs> Incredibly tall women, and every single one of them is married to a farty little rock star. It's true. Every <laughs> farty little rock star, he's got an incredibly tall missus on the end of his hand, hasn't he? It's Simon Le Bon, Mick Jagger, David Bowie, Nick Rhodes, Rod Stewart, that bloke out of you two, Billy Joel, a farty little rock star and incredibly tall women. There they go, incredibly tall wife and a farty little rock star. I mean, there was a time when rock stars boasted about the length of their dick. Now it's the length of the chick, isn't it? <laughs> Look there, eh? Unbelievable. <laughs> She tall, there's snow on the peak. Look at that. <laughs> I tell you, when they all go out together, you know, and all the, all the long and the short of it, when they all go out together, like at the Grammy Awards or the opening of Planet Hollywood or something, I'll tell you what it reminds me of. That scene in Mickey Mouse's Fantasia when all the mops dance with the buckets. <laughs> <laughs> What kind of role models are these? Supermodels, the new superstars. I mean, these people are anorexic, half-starved. The only way real women could ever have a figure like that would be to, I don't know, go down the fairground mirrors, have a laugh in the crazy mirrors. Oh, look at me, me tits are up there. There's, <laughs> there. There's nothing in between. Look at that. He, he, he. Don't stand there laughing too long. Rod Stewart will come up behind you and shag you. <laughs> Being a single mum, my family are the root cause of all society's ills. So I have to ask a lot from my powder. <laughs> Judy's a busy prostitute and a heroine. So I never know what I'll find on her tops. Blood? Vomit? The sexual effluvia of her last client. <laughs> Billy's getting too big for so-called joyriding now. And since he's started mugging, he's come home covered in all sorts of filth. Thanks, Mum. And don't ladder it when you nut some old lady. <laughs> so remember, Next time you want something whitewashed, use a single mum. <laughs> Has there ever been a more pointless exercise than fashion? You know, high fashion. Not the fashion we do, the, the high fashion. Every year, we're treated to this meaningless display of clueless drivel, New York, or Paris, or London. Have you ever wondered why they have to use such extraordinary-looking women to model these things? It's because the clothes are so unutterably crap. I mean, if you've got some Euro git with a fan and a ponytail, it says, this year, of course, I have used the barbed wire for the knickers, of course. <laughs> A piece of curl between the buttocks, yes, it's very nice. Hello, good boy, thank you, hippie be shake. And then there's, there's some book from the clothes show saying, and this is what we'll all be wearing in the high school. <laughs> yeah. Will we bother? <laughs> you never see it again. And having designed all this, like, ill-coordinated rubbish, it, the fashion industry actually has the gall to tell us that our bodies are either out or in. You know, have you been reading that? You know, waifs are in and busts are out. Oh, busty woman, no, no, thin woman. That's what I mean. What is that about? Oh, look at her tits, they're so unfashionable. Can you believe it? <laughs> well, you think about it, ladies. Supposing it happened at a party. You're halfway through a lovely evening and your knockers go out of fashion. You'd be mortified. We'd have to run for the door, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, the myth must be exploded. I mean, we are actually being encouraged to redesign our bodies, brutalise and attack our own bodies in pursuit of some spurious definition of beauty as laid down by the movies and the magazines. They want us to suck it out, cut it off, pump it up, pull it back. Oh, oh. <laughs> I mean, it's not just women. Men, too, are now being encouraged to try and improve their bodies. I mean, this business about dick extensions. I mean, <laughs> I mean come on. I mean, it, it, the original dick extension operation involved a cutting of the willy in half. 
how small would your willy have to be before you'd let a doctor cut it in half? <laughs> well, I'd have to have a concave willy. I would have to be growing out of my bum. I'd have enough trouble wondering about whether it's going to stay up, let alone whether it's going to fall apart or not. <laughs> but of course, women are the real victims of the cosmetic method. I mean, well, I'm going to say this. The producer doesn't want me to talk about this, but I'm going to, because it's a difficult subject, and some people find it upsetting, and he said, don't do it, particularly on the first show. And if, if you don't like it, you find it distasteful, well, I apologise in advance, put the kettle on or something, but I'm going to discuss it. <laughs> Baywatch. <laughs> no, we're going to take it on. Baywatch, or Wank Watch, as I think it should perhaps be titled. Well, come on, lad. Denying it, are you? He goes shopping on a Saturday afternoon. You say, don't hurry back, darling. <laughs> you can't believe your luck, can you? Straight in the sitting room, can of beer on one arm of the sofa, boxer Kleenex on the other. <laughs> the images, <laughs> the images of women on that program. Oh, they're tough women. Oh, yes, they're tough. They're strong. Oh, no nonsense. They're lifesavers. They've got broad shoulders. They've got big chests. But not a pubic hair between them. <laughs> no women with the genitalia of 11-year-olds. What is that about? <laughs> Completely bald. Kojak crutches everyone. <laughs> what must they do with all the pubic hairs they tear out of those poor actresses on Baywatch? They could stuff a mattress the size of California. <laughs> it must be like a torture chamber in makeup. Every morning, next, Fanny, let's wax it down. <laughs> Let's tear it out. I mean, the swimming cosies. The swimming cosies they wear. These are working women. They're lifesavers. They've got these cosies. They, they sort of disappear right up and they're in danger of garroting their rectums. I mean, these cosies, they go like that. There's room behind them for about one pube, I reckon. I mean, so it hung out straight. I mean, what is it about? Oh, come on, girls. All right. I mean, if they're growing down to your knees, then blonde the last six inches. OK. <laughs> and the state of these fannies after the waxing. I mean, what do they do with them? They're smooth as silk. It's like they've been laminated. You could eat your dinner off them, these. <laughs> these fannies have been sanded down, I swear. <laughs> Bring me the teacup. I want to buff this muff. All right. <laughs> <laughs> have they all got to be so perfect? I mean, they're lifesavers. You'd think there'd be room on the set for one big old Bertha on the team who did yet. This goes out on a Saturday afternoon. What are we saying? There's young girls watching it, 12, 13 years old. What are they supposed to make of it? I mean, they don't know any different. They think that's the norm. They're sitting there watching it going, oh, my God! Mum, <laughs> already escaping out of me knickers and down me leg. <laughs> Mum, I am the Yeti woman. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have to regain control of our image. We don't look like we're supposed to look, and we don't make love like we're supposed to make love. Every time you see a film or open a magazine, it's an insult. All these mags with nothing but sex on the cover. Sex and the orgasm, sex and gardening, elegant cuisine, plus sex. I saw this article. <laughs> In one of them, some glossy mag, I don't know, it said 20 exciting positions for exciting lovers. 20 positions, I'm thinking. 20? <laughs> No, two. <laughs> well, four if I open my eyes, I suppose. <laughs> well, hang on, there's lads out there that you blimey, Ben. Two? What's your other one then? <laughs> well, you know the one, conscious. <laughs> That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks a lot. We'll be back next week. My name's Ben Elton. Good night. for you, and we're the mugs will have to pay for it. Well, mugs we are.